A shocking and horrifying scene was uncovered in New Mexico. Police raided, we'll show you, a makeshift compound outside Santa Fe, looking for a three-year-old who'd been missing since late last year. Instead, they found 11 malnourished children, who the sheriff says looked in his view like, quote, third world country refugees. The children's ages ranged from one to 15. They had no food, no running water, wore dirty rags for clothing. CNN's Kaylee Hartung is following this for us. So Kaylee, at this point, we know police have charged five people with child abuse, including what they believe is the mothers of some of these, of, of these children. There are so many unanswered questions about all of this. What more are you learning? Yeah, Kate, the, the sheriff saying these are the saddest living conditions and poverty that he's ever seen. Authorities are still in the process of determining what these 11 children endured in these conditions, but the information they have to this point has led them to charge all five adults with 11 counts of child abuse each. The two men, they're facing criminal charges as well. One of those men, Siraj Wahaj, he's believed to be the father of that child, the missing three-year-old who is still missing, that child not among the 11 children found here, though that's what authorities expected to find. You mentioned the three women believed to be the mothers of those 11 children, all of these adults in custody, though it doesn't sound like they're answering many of the authorities' questions. None of them have been forthcoming with any information related to that missing three-year-old, his current whereabouts, I should say, today, that child's fourth birthday. But the sheriff says he does have reason to believe that child was there in recent weeks. Kate, those two men were found heavily armed when authorities raided the compound. We're talking about AR-15s, loaded pistols, loaded 30-round magazines. You said it. So many more questions than answers as we learn more and see these truly shocking pictures. Kelly, I want to make sure I heard you right. Today is the foyer, is the child's birthday? It is. God, that tears you up. Thanks so much, Kaylee. That child's still missing. But what happens with the children that they have in custody? What happens with these children now? Well, joining me right now is Cabinet Secretary for New Mexico's Children, Youth, and Families Department, Monique Jacobson. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. So the sheriff says that he's been working his job for 30 years, and he's never seen anything like this. What can you tell us about these children and how they're doing? I can tell you that we have a full team of people right now that are really focused on making sure that, that we are looking out for the safety and well-being of these children. You know, we have people that are doing different types of assessments and, and working with the children. Our first goal, of course, is just to minimize any sort of additional trauma that any of these children would, would be experiencing, make sure we're getting their basic needs met and surrounding them with, with caring people. The sheriff said that the 11 children looked like they were third world country refugees, not only with no water, uh, no food, no water, uh, but with no shoes or personal hygiene. What is, with all of that in mind, what's the first priority if these are the conditions that they were found in or living in? You know, the first thing we always want to do is make sure that we're getting their most basic needs met. So getting them fed, um, of course, hydration is, is really important and essential. Um, and then making sure that we can get them cleaned up and comfortable clothing. Like, we really want to make these kids as comfortable as possible before we have to ask them any questions or, or try to learn more about what, what was occurring in their environment. And I know it's a difficult position of what you can discuss and can't because we are talking about minors, of course, um, who've been through unbelievable, unbelievable horror already. Do you have any idea how long they've been in these living conditions? You know, yeah, I can't really speak to any of the specifics as it's part of both an ongoing investigation for us as well as yeah. for law enforcement. But of course, those are all the things that, that we're looking into um, while also making sure just that their immediate needs are being met and that we're doing what we can again to make them as comfortable as possible. Yeah, and are, are they talking? I'm sorry, are they what? Are, are, are they talking? Like, is that part of where you are in the process of, I mean, like, talking to you about what they've been dealing with? So one thing that typically in, in a situation like this, of course, we work to get their basic needs met. And then we do usually do what are called forensic interviews. So we have mm -hmm. experts who will interview the children to, again, try to get as much information as possible. Um, 
in, in terms of, of what they know, what they've experienced, what was going on where uh, in the environment that they've been removed from. So that's definitely a part, a part of the process. I will tell you just from other similar situations that, that we've had, it can take children some time before they feel comfortable um, in terms of talking and, and really yeah. letting us know things that, that were occurring. So it's important that we not do anything to, to rush that, but that we really kind of respect where, where they are and what they're comfortable with disclosing at this time. Absolutely. And unfortunately, you see a lot of horrible cases of horrible things that happen to children. How do you make sense of something like this? Oh, there is, you know, any time a, a child's basic needs are not being met, it's it's heartbreaking. It's horrific, and um, I think I don't think there is truly a way to make sense of it. What I can tell you is that we really focus on on doing all we can again to to minimize that trauma and to get them in a place in a position where where they can recover from what's happened to them. You know, some people tell me you can never truly recover from it, but I will tell you, I've met some amazing, remarkable young people who went through horrific things in their past, and, and they're incredible. And just to get to see the lives that they've gone on to live, I think it gives us hope. It gives us a belief that as long as we do, the community, our staff, everyone that, that kind of, that they end up interacting with, as long as we all really come together to support them, I've, I've gotten to see, I guess, the, the, that there can be incredible futures for children that have experienced really horrific pasts. It is amazing how resilient young children really are, um, but it is absolutely a very long road ahead for them, no matter what they're up against. Um, Monique Jacobson, thank you so much for um, speaking to us about where they are in their process going forward. We'll stay close to this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And again, a three-year-old, now four-year-old today on his birthday, is still missing. And that is what kind of sparked all of this, this search for a now four-year-old missing little boy. We'll continue to follow this.